Hi everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Eileen Mannion. I'm Vice President of Marketing here in the UK and my pronouns are she and her. So I'm really excited to be here as part of this I Am Remarkable Week. It's a virtual experience celebrating the power of diversity, inclusion and allyship by shining a light on remarkable stories and encouraging everyone to embrace their own achievements. I'm Remarkable is a global Google program striving to empower everyone, but with a particular focus on women and underrepresented groups to help them to celebrate their achievements in the workplace and beyond. So I had the pleasure of meeting today's guest speaker, Dr. Rilla Hallam, for the first time in 2018 at our partner event, Zeitgeist, and her story and her work moved me immeasurably. She's a Syrian doctor, a humanitarian and a human rights campaigner focused on saving children's lives on the front line. She's the founder and CEO of Can Do, a pioneering global community of humanitarians working to transform the way the world supports people in war devastated areas, a charity we're proud to support here at Google. Rula has been sharing her voice on global stages over recent years and has been honored with several awards, including becoming the first Syrian TED Fellow. To date, she has helped build seven hospitals in Syria, including the first ever crowdfunded hospital, and which together they have helped care for over three million people. She's an advocate for the protection of healthcare and civilians in conflict. She has shared stages with presidents, celebrities, and grassroots activists. Her work has been featured in leading publications and shows, such as the New York Times, The Daily Show, and in two BBC documentaries. And her online talks have been seen by over 11 million people, inspiring thousands to support Candu's mission. She truly epitomizes what it means to be remarkable. Rilla, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Eileen, the, the honor is all mine. So pleased to be here. Hi, everybody. I'm so used to normally being in a room, seeing people and faces. It's so weird staring at a screen. So. Um, Please comment and like, you know, instead of me normally seeing smiles and nodding, please put things in the comments so that I can know if like it makes sense or if you need me to go over something. But yeah, lovely to be here. Oh, thank you, Roland. We'd love to be in a room all together, but please know people are out there and taking a huge amount of value from what we're about to hear. As I've had a couple of conversations with you in the past, I know what uh, incredible learning journey you've been on. So... Let's start with that journey, Rilla, and I'd like to begin by hearing about the road you took to becoming a medic. Um, you've said that you knew you wanted, uh, you knew from the age of six, in fact, that you wanted to be a doctor. You then moved to the UK, age 12, not speaking English, and told by the age of 16 by your teachers that your grades were not good enough for you to become a doctor. So just firstly, how did you have the self-belief to follow your passion, despite being told it wasn't possible? And what happened next? So I think I was actually born a doctor. I definitely remember when I was a six year old playing with my siblings and cousins in, in Damascus and, and insisting on being the surgeon who was performing the life saving surgery on our Barbies and Cindy's. Um, and so when age 12, we moved to the UK and I didn't speak in English. Um, it was a very discombobulating experience because suddenly we were plonked in white middle class England and we didn't only sound different, but we'd look different. Um, do you remember, did you ever have own clothes day at school where you had like a day where you could just go without where you're wearing your uniform? Well, we have never had that in Syria. In Syria, we were, all we were all in secondary school have to wear a military uniform because every morning, at least once a day, we would all be called to, you know, the, the play yard so that we can salute Hafez al-Assad, our president forever, because we were all his army. And so when the opportunity came to wear your own clothes day, I was like, yes, I'm going to show them my style. And, um, and I wore this orange and white pleated skirt with a matching shirt and bow tie and my frilly white socks and, and shoes and, and walked into school. <gasps> To horror, to horror, I didn't get the memo. Everyone was in jeans and t-shirt. I suck at 
like a sore thumb. It was awful. And so that really just started just not wasn't just about not speaking English, but it was about the bullying. It was about the fact that kids are so mean sometimes. Humans are so mean sometimes when they don't understand us and when, when, when they don't know us. Um, and I failed every exam that year except chemistry and, and maths because I guess there were symbols and, and it was the only language I knew how to speak when I didn't speak English. And yeah, you're right. When it came to, to applying for university, my teacher said my grades were not good enough. I should apply for chemistry or biology. And I thought it was the most preposterous thing. Like, of course, I was going to be a doctor. And so I applied and one medical school gave me a place and saw my possibility. And so I feel like my message for you today is about like the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dream. And I feel like it wasn't so much my self-belief because it's not like I thought I was really smart. I didn't, didn't know I was going to succeed. But what I did believe in and absolutely still believe in now is the possibility, the potential, wow. the capacity that I didn't know. Like Just like you never know if you're going to succeed or not. But what I do know is that if you have an absolute firm belief that you have it within you and that belief is unshakable, that you can do it. Wow, I love that. Already a, a great start to the talk. I'm sure people are scribbling down as, as you're speaking. But let's keep on your journey, Villa, if we can. And could you talk me through the events of 2011 uh, and your journey of working in Syria, your, your homeland? Sure. So in 2011, I think that Syrians finally lost their fear and found their voice. I think they were buoyed by the so-called Arab Spring and the revolutions that were sweeping the Arab world. And, and finally, they took to the streets in droves. My, my cousins and my siblings were there at the time. And when they describe it, they were talking about a festival-like atmosphere. They said that women and, and men and children, Sunnis and Alawis, everyone was in the street and they were shouting freedom, dignity, Hariya karame. They had literally lost that fear and he said like people were making food and and dancing and chanting it really was a joyous and and um and non-violent experience but sadly instead of the government and the regime instead of meeting it with reform met it with with bullets and bombs and the war on civilians that we all know about ensued and and, and engulfed the entire country now, at the time, I was working full time in the UK. I was specializing in anesthesia and intensive care. And I really did the only thing I knew I could. And I joined the humanitarian effort. Um, at the beginning, I would, I would just send money or I would send medical supplies. And then before I knew it, I was needing to fundraise for it. And then before I knew it, I was going on medical missions to Syria in order to deliver medical aid, to you know, work as a doctor in hospitals to build hospitals myself. And, and I guess it was on that journey that I made a really important discovery. I realized that the reason that people survive in crisis is because of the remarkable work of the people in crisis themselves. You know, I used to think it was the UN and the Save the Children's and those organizations that were saving people. And, you know, I know they do do good work, but most of them are in the safety of the refugee countries. And it is the local doctors, nurses, and aid workers who are in the eye of the storm, who are there on the front line, risking their lives to save others and working where others can't or won't. Um, it was a, really a remarkable discovery that very much um, was the founding philosophy for Can Do. Wow. So, so you went to Syria, Willa, and um, began working as a, as a on, on medical missions there and continued your work there going back to Syria despite the death of many family members and knowing that hundreds of medics had been killed in the field and indeed some had been sadly tortured too. So what drove you to, con to continue this work despite the horrors that surround you? I mean, I remember being on a medical mission back in at the end of 2012 and, and I'm walking around and I'm in, in an internally displaced camp and I'm seeing the faces of all of these people who literally were telling me how they had to leave in the dead of night with the clothes on their back and they've lost everything. And just look, seeing the shock and the horror on their face and they, they were li living with a piece of thin cloth above their heads that they called the tent and they had no 
they had no food, no money, no medication, no clean water. And I just remember calling my friend, Dr. Saleha, who was a doctor and a humanitarian, but also worked in the media. And I was like, where the fuck are the journalists? Like, why aren't they here seeing what I'm seeing? Why aren't they here telling the world about the humanitarian catastrophe? Why is it that we only focus on the bang bang stories instead of showing the, the enormous um, toll that this was taking on civilians, the fact that this was not a civil war, that this was a war on civilians. Um, and so I feel like, you know, didn't realize actually that that, that phone call was going to change rapidly the, the trajectory of my life, because of course, that's the call that that led to, to the first BBC Panorama documentary, Saving Serious Children, that I was involved in. Oh, wonderful. And so incredible experiences. And I think you, you talked to, to me before about one of the most horrific experiences you had was in August 2013, when an incendiary weapon attack uh, hit a children's hospital and was captured by that BBC crew in the Saving Syria, Saving Serious Children documentary. Willa, are you able to tell us a bit about that moment and that what, what we saw in that documentary and what that led to? And please, everyone, it will be distressing what you hear, but it's important that we understand Willa's work and what Can Do are doing today even. So <clears throat> that phone call to Dr. Saleha resulted in the BBC Panorama team agreeing and very much wanting to, to, to showcase the humanitarian catastrophe, but they, they insisted that it needed to be through my eyes and through my work, which Honestly, initially, I was completely against. I was like, no, 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 like, this is not what I do. This is not about me. I'm, I'm a doctor. I don't want to be on television. I don't know how to be on screen. Um, you know, this is this is not about me. I kept repeating that. I was like, this is this is not about me. This is about the people who I who I want to, you know, to, to shine a light on. And and that's really when the penny dropped for me that this wasn't about me. This really was about me shining a light on these atrocities, on these crimes, on, on the horrific situation that I was seeing, but not just only on the darkness, but on the light that I was also seeing, on the remarkable people who were there risking their lives to save others. And so off we went in August 2013, and I was on the, one of my medical missions, and we were in one of the hospitals that I had helped to set up when um, a seven-month-old baby was brought in with severe burns by his dad. And he told us that um, a ball of fire had fallen from the sky onto his house and onto the school next door. And so as we tended to the baby's burns, over the next few minutes, one after the other, after the other of these, more of these children kept appearing. And honestly, Eileen, I felt like I'd been transported onto the, 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 the scene, onto the stage of a horror movie in Hollywood. I'd never, ever seen anything like that before. The children were covered in a white powder dust. Their skin was literally falling off them. They were screaming in pain. Some of them weirdly and very concerningly not even crying in pain, which tells me that they had severe burns. And, you know, that day is really etched on my heart, mind and soul. Um, for, for, for so many reasons, right? We shouldn't be talking about this. We shouldn't be saying that children got burnt while they were trying to study at, at school. But, you know, what one of the things that I find most disturbing about that day is that that day I had the knowledge, skill, and ability to administer the best emergency treatment those kids could have, right? That day I should have been able to give them oxygen, sedation, anesthesia, put a breathing tube in, put them on a ventilator and send them in a fully medically escorted ambulance in safety to Turkey where they would go to intensive care to, to have their burns treated. But instead, I had to send them suffocating, in pain, of course, haven't done my best, of course, haven't given them everything that I could, but they didn't get the best because those of us on the front lines, the local doctors, nurses, and aid workers who are there able to save lives are not getting the resources and the tools and the equipment that we need. Um, and, and that really was, if, if, if that realization that it was the locals who were doing it, that was the sort of founding philosophy, I think it was this event 
that made me realize uh, this is not good enough. We we can do better. We should do better. And it really was the the impetus for for, for founding Camdo. Well, you've been through so much, and we'll, we'll talk in a minute about you as a person and your how you kept yourself well. But moving on to Candu, because your work as a frontline medic and as part of this uh, Candu work has included building seven bombed hospitals, one of them, as I said before, from the first ever crowdfunded hospital called Hope Hospital for Children, um, all with very little access to funds and resources. Um, I'd love to hear more about how you managed to do this. So this is taking me back to November 2016. And I was, as you said, in the stages of founding my startup can do at the time. And Aleppo, our second biggest city in the north of Syria at the time was besieged and being heavily bombarded. I don't know if you remember it from the news. And I had got message that that weekend, five hospitals were bombed, um, including the last remaining children's hospital. When I got that text message from one of my colleagues, I was, I felt absolutely devastated. He'd sent me footage of the head nurse, Malake, as she was grabbing like premature babies out of the incubators, like desperate to put them to her chest to get them to safety before she broke down in tears. Um, and, 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 and I was, I was so heartbroken and I was raging because, you know, we had been standing up for years saying our hospitals are being bombed. You know, Physicians for Human Rights, a US-based organization has to date said there's been over 800 attacks on hospitals and medical facilities. And um, this is against international humanitarian laws, against the Geneva Convention, and yet it's still happening. It happened just this year, um, um, three months ago. Um, and so, I spent a weekend honestly in rage, Eileen. I was stomping around, effing and blinding and swearing until I was able to finally sit down and I was like, why am I doing this? And I just had to take my, I had to connect with that love inside of me instead of the anger that was raging around me. And I reminded myself, I'm here to save lives. I'm here to uphold these values that, that it's not okay to bomb hospitals, that we must save lives regardless. And, and when I was able to harness that anger and change it, then I had this like, ding, this light bulb moment happen. And suddenly I was like, oh, I know what we're gonna do. We're, we're gonna bloody rebuild a whole new children's hospital. <laughs> I was like, we're going to rebuild a whole new children's hospital. And you know what? We're going to take the medical equipment for this hospital all the way from London to Syria on a convoy. And us ordinary people are going to take this convoy and escort it. And we're going to call it the People's Convoy. And so we launched the People's Convoy. And, and honestly, some people thought I'd gone mad, um, that I'd finally lost my marbles. And um, I was due to um, launch the campaign um, with Jon Snow on Channel 4, which the Brits and anyone who knows the news is, I mean, he's a bit of a legend. And so um, I, the night before it happened, had called my partner and I was like, shit, like, oh my God, what if this is a massive failure? Like, what if... I, this is the biggest humiliation that I've ever done in my life. Like I'm calling everyone I know, every Nobel Peace Laureate, every head of organization. I'm like, you know, what if this is, what if this, what if they're right? What if I am completely bonkers and, and, and this doesn't happen? And, you know, he just held my fear and reminded me of one of my mottos, which is it's, it, it's, it's not about the winning, it's about the trying. And so we launched it and, and we did it. It was amazing. Thousands of people from around the world joined the campaign and we didn't just meet our target. We smashed it. We got 250% of the, of, the, of the amount that we needed to raise. And, and off we went on convoy um, from, from London to Syria. Um, two weeks later, through a sandstorm, through a snowstorm and, um, and arrived on Christmas Eve. Wow. And it just goes to show, Eileen, the incredible power of collective action. Like when we all come together, we can really move mountains. It's incredible that energy that we get because it's, 
you know, when the IDA, the Syri our Syrian partners and the doctors and nurses who were we supporting with this campaign, you know, when they heard about it, they they were they were they were incredulous. They literally said to me, like, we thought no one cared. Mm. Like they had felt like all of these years they've been screaming and shouting and they are unheard and they are unseen. And when they saw thousands of people, not just supporting this campaign, but sending in comments from like Australia and Peru and America and from around the world, it gave them so much hope to continue that that's why they called it Hope Hospital for Children. And, you know, it's been open since April 2017 and have they treated nearly 100,000 children. So that is the power of crowdfunding and that's the power of collective action. Wow, and that does give us all hope. Um, truly remarkable, Willa. And so obviously that led to the official creation of Can Do, as you said. And, you know, you describe it, uh, hear it being described as a new vision for humanitarian aid delivery in war zones, which is about, as you said, getting aid to the right person at the right time to the people who need it, need it most on the front lines and it's been going for five years now um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what any other big highlights or achievements over that five years of just doing this remarkable work so one of the things that I think led me to setting up can do was just seeing ordinary people doing extraordinary things. You know, you, the war brings out the worst in people, but it also brings out the absolute best. And there I was seeing people who were risking their lives to, see, to, to save others every single day they were doing it, no matter how much they were at risk, how much how they were injured, how much it was affecting their lives, people were still doing it. And so, but the problem was that their efforts were not being supported. Not only were they not being given the resources, but they weren't given, I mean, the dignity, the respect of actually saying, hey, you probably know how to, to, to solve your problems best. Let me support you, you know? Um, I feel like the current humanitarian system does this. It sees a problem and it jumps in and it goes, I know what you need. We're gonna give you this, this, this. We're gonna do this, this, and this. You do this, you do this, and you do this. Instead of, seeing a problem and asking who's here, who's doing what, who knows what to do what, what do you need, how can we support you? And that's what I feel Can Do does. We, we know that the most effective, cost efficient and impactful way to, to save lives on the front lines is to support these frontline health workers. And so that's why I set up the Can Do Action platform. And the idea was linking all of these trusted and vetted local aid workers to you and you and you and you and you and you. Um, you know, people who are actually really fed up with the old way of doing charity, where you give money to charity and you don't know where the money's gone, how much of it arrived and what good it's done and you feel completely disconnected from that, from that outcome. Whereas on the Can Do platform, you know if you've given money, you're giving it to a children to build a children's hospital. You know you're giving it to support a mobile health clinic. You know you're giving it to a midwifery training program, and you and you get to know who you're giving it to. You know that 90% of your donation is going straight to that project, which is so much better than what most charities are because they take 30% or more. And so. Yeah, 16 projects later, we've we've wow. reached nearly a million people directly and indirectly. So I would love it, love it, love it if um, we can reach a million before the end of the year. So go to candoaction.org, support our work. Let's get to a million, everybody. Oh, I really sincerely hope you do. And I think you will, knowing you, Rilla. So you just, just on to you personally now for a moment, Rilla. And you say this has been a journey of finding your voice as you became a campaigner alongside your work, obviously as a doctor, and speaking out to protect medics and civilians in conflict. I'd love to hear more about this journey of finding your voice and where are you now with that journey and what does it mean for you? Oh, I love the subject matter now. Like, I'm, <laughs> Now that I'm a mum, I feel like I am on a mission. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's oh my God, been such an incredible, huge learning opportunity. I mean, talk about finding my voice. I think she's been such a driver for that. I've learned so much from that whole experience. But, you know, I feel like I'm now, I mean, look, I'm still on the journey. Um, and um, 
I'm going to be further along it next year when I come back. But, you know, I feel like now I'm on a mission to help others to find their voice and to connect with their power. I really want my daughter and all daughters and all of us here to truly believe in our power so we can stand up, speak out and lead on the front lines of change. I feel like for years, I really poo-pooed when minimized myself, Eileen. I feel like for years I was like, you know what? My story is not important. It's not unique. It's not original. It's not different. You know, um, you know, who wants to know about my trauma and my pain? I'm going to put that in a box and lock it with a key and throw it in the sea. Um, you know, I think after my experience of being a bullied teenager, I... I became Fortress Rilla, you know, like strength was one of my personas. And so I wasn't going to say I was struggling. I wasn't going to reach out and say I was hurting. I wasn't going to reach out and say I was in pain. I wasn't going to reach out and say, I'm so desperately sad. I can't get out of bed. Um, and so I would deny my emotions. You know, I would suppress them. And, and the worst of it is I didn't even realize I was doing that. I feel like, I don't know if you associate with this at all, Eileen, but like, I remember like towards the early years, like 2012, 2013, like I would throw all my grief and energy into working, into doing, like that was my way of dealing with it. But then there'd be times when like, I'd have a sip of wine. I don't drink now, but there'd be times back then when I'd have a sip of wine and suddenly I'd be like, Whoa! you know, and there, and I'd be thinking like, oh, I'm in touch with my emotions. I'm expressing my emotions. But Actually, in hindsight, it was definitely not. It was my emotions like going, oh, quick, she's taking the lid off. Quick, go, 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 escape. You know, like, just like ready to bloody explode out of me, you know. And 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 that's nothing to do, you know, and that was nothing to do also with the fears that we have about embracing our voice, right? Like the fear of judgment or the fear of failure or, you know, in my in my instance, it wasn't so much that fear as it was the, the, my inner critic. I don't know if you have an inner critic, oh, Eileen. Yes, big one. Very <laughs> noisy sometimes. That's awful. You know, so mm. I used to call mine the little shit. So he would, and him and I, it was a him for some reason, we were constantly in battle. You know, um, I, I, I thought the best way to like deal with this little shit was to, to be in conflict with them, to be like, I'm going to beat you. You will not let me stop, you know. And um, anyway, I now know that, that that's definitely not the right way because when we, when we, suppress our thoughts or fight ourselves when we deny our pain when we deny our story all we do is we cage ourselves up we build barriers we build walls we we, we disconnect from ourselves and we disconnect from the other we disconnect from our own power and we disconnect from our own voice because suddenly instead of me just showing up as me full authentic me with a capital a these barriers are there to help me like hide and defend or prove or protect do you know what i mean and so you know i'm now so passionate about this that i do one-to-one -one coaching and run workshops on it and and webinars so you know i'm going to drop a link in the in the chat to, if you want to join any of the free webinars but i now know that the answer is to embrace ourselves fully embrace ourselves which means allow accept love and nurture you know remove these barriers remove these walls that's what's going to help us to connect and what's going to help us to be you know full or full authentic us um you know we don't have time to go into all of the house but but i know that how i dealt with little shit in the end was and um, what i went to this really powerful workshop with the dr dick schwartz who works with profoundly um, disturbed mental health patients is a psychiatrist and he has found through his work um, that the best way for us to deal with our different internal selves is to make friends with them and he took us through this process and again I'm going to drop a link into the chat for you to do it took us through this process of talking to that bit of ourselves and honestly it sounds a bit like eh? I'm talking to myself I know bear with me but it was so, so profound because actually what you come to realize is that that bit of you that has been your obstacle has been trying to protect you. 
and little Jet had been trying to protect me all this time. And so, you know, it was so profound um, and so important way of knowing that we fighting ourselves and dealing with ourselves in that way isn't going to get us anyway. So anywhere. So, you know, open up yourself to yourself, stop minimizing yourself. Um, and just, yeah, imagine what, what you can do if you are your biggest, best self. So please embrace yourself. And, uh, you know, we, we, I think we've all got that little voice, haven't we? That's sort of holding us back. So thank you so much for being so honest and open about sharing your experience and how, you, how you've been dealing with that. And I think at Google here, you know, we're definitely on a mission to make sure everyone can bring their whole self, you know, to, to work, to all aspects of their lives if possible. And I think your experiences um, are going to be so valuable to so many. But it, it's been 10 years now since the Civil War began, and you've obviously seen so many horrors that you said even today are etched on your heart, your mind, and your soul. Can you tell us a little bit about how you sort of how you've dealt with that, how you've stayed strong or the strong person you are today and resilient in these crisis situations like, like war um, and how you've looked after your own mental health and physical health to sort of deal with that trauma. Has that been part of that journey about sort of looking at yourself harder inside out? Anything more you, you could share on how you, you managed and dealt with that? Yeah, I mean... If, if I am on a mission to help people connect with their power and their inner voice, then I am absolutely on a mission for them to do so whilst absolutely putting themselves and their health and their well-being first and centre. Um, Eileen, I learned it the very hard way, um, like like often, like is often the case, unfortunately, you know, it, it took first me, first of all, really crashing and burning, having a severe, you know, collapse in 2014, um, to, to even recognize that that the pace I was going at was was completely unsustainable. Um, I, you know, honestly, I thought it was just going to be a few weeks, and then I thought it was going to be a few months, and we thought it was going to be a year, and then three years later, I'd been working literally every day, every evening, every weekend. Even my holidays were medical missions to Syria, and so I I totally crashed and burnt. And um, you know, I. I feel like I feel like all of us are a hindrance to ourselves when it comes to this. I don't know if you have this, Eileen, or anyone else associate with this here, but I often think that like self-care and looking after myself is a luxury that I just don't have the time for. Like any mums here or any parents in general would probably identify with this. And, mm -hmm. and I really literally did think that. I was like, you know, I don't have the time or the money or the energy to look after myself. Like, and this is not about me. This is about, you know, what I'm here to do. And so I thought of it as a luxury. The second problem is I think you, so many of us in our quest to look strong, equate being strong with not calling for help, equate being strong with hiding our emotions. Like, you know, like men don't cry and strong women don't cry, you know? And and I feel like even though we've gone a long way on that, I feel like that still remains for many of us like a, a deep-seated belief. Um, and then I think also, I don't know if you've ever been told this, Eileen, but I, you know, I was told so many times, slow down it's a marathon not a sprint mm -hmm. yeah. and i'm like now i know like i know people were saying it with love and if you're one of these people who have said it to me and you're listening then like i know you said it with love but it's bullshit because what i now know is it's not a marathon it's a relay you are meant to run and you're meant to run for a bit but it's meant to be a team sport. You're meant to run for a bit and then you're meant to hand on the button and say, right, off you go, it's your turn now. And you're then meant to rest and recover and recharge. Not because you've hit rock bottom, not because you're weak, but because if you want to last, if you really truly want to create incredible change in the workplace, if you truly want to be remarkable, if you truly want you know, to, to be beating down these systems of prejudice, whether it's against you know, the problems we have against the LGBTQ community, any racism, any form of discrimination, that is a long road. And the answer isn't to just keep going at a snail's pace. The answer is we have to run and then stop and have a team and have support around. And honestly, it took getting pregnant to realize, to like really fully realize this. I feel like God was like, 
you're an idiot. I've given you so many chances and you're still trying to burn it at both ends. And so I got pregnant and then I suddenly was like, oh, oh, wow. Oh, actually, to really fully look after someone else, I need to look after myself. Like it really suddenly just switched in my head that they are to make a difference. It's the two sides of the same coin to really, truly make a difference. I needed to be in the best state health body mind and soul and so my message to everyone here today is put the oxygen mask on yourself first oh, put wow. the oxygen mask on yourself first you need to look after yourself body mind and soul we cannot heal the world if we are deeply wounded we can't bring down the patriarchy in any other system of prejudice if we if we haven't accepted and learned to love ourselves and, and we certainly can't bring about world peace if we have an internal conflict and have a war raging within us. So absolutely essential that we look after ourselves as we as we go on our life's journey in whichever capacity it is. Thank you so much for sharing that message, Rilla. I'm at the ripe old age of 48 and it took me a very long time to put my oxygen mask on, way too long. Uh, you know, again, it was motherhood, it was growing up, it was learning by mistakes. Uh, but absolutely, I really, uh, I really value that message you've shared with all of our, our viewers and listeners today. Thank you so much for sharing that experience. Uh, I can relate to it so much on so many I know, levels. I I know, it's so much much people's faces to be able to see, like people nodding, or, or maybe not. Maybe like people have got it sorted, and and I that would be amazing. But yeah, I'm, I I, I doubt that very much of all the of people I've met, especially even those who who are from uh, you know underrepresented groups, probably feel that they've got even more work to do to prove themselves, and uh, and often women too, uh, even yes. if they're not from an underrepresented ethnic background. So I think yes. you'll find a lot of people nodding out there. So um. Just, just moving on a little bit um, about your work today. And as I said, earlier this year, it was the 10-year uh, anniversary since the Civil War began. And earlier this year, the BBC aired a documentary which revisited the 2013 attack and interviewed some of the victims from that day. And they also shared some truly shocking statistics, such as 6 million children have been born into war, approximately 25,000 children have been killed and thousands of schools have been either totally or even partially destroyed. And according to UNICEF, there were 61 attacks in, on schools in 2020 alone. So now I understand your focus today, Willa, is at the moment on protecting schools. Can you share some of the details on this with us? Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> when the BBC team who we'd done the original documentary with reached out to me and said, how about we do a, a follow-up so that we can really tell the story of the survivors and the victim families and, and, and in fact not tell their story, get them to tell their own story. I thought it was so profoundly important that people have their own voice to tell their own story and that that tragedy um, and, and as well as the resilience that they have to continue in, in the face of such loss um, was so important to tell. But like you said, what was really important to also tell was that that horrific as it was, wasn't even the only school. It's one of over a thousand schools that was bombed. That Those bombings are still happening to this day. There was one that was bombed just a few weeks ago. And after the first documentary, the Saving Serious um, Children documentary, um, by the way, we put a link in the in the comments for you to, for anyone to watch it. Um, you know, I naively thought, Eileen, honestly, that when people watch that, especially world leaders, when they saw the horror that was going on, when they saw that children were being bombed and burnt alive, that they would do something to stop it. And that didn't happen. And this time around, I was like, right, I ain't repeating the same mistake again. And so, you know, I spoke with our local partners and I said, you know, as a doctor, I am fed up of just treating children once they come burnt, injured, bombed and traumatized. I, I want us to try and stop the bombs from falling on children in the first place. Now, we don't have a military and we haven't been able to stop the war. We will continue to advocate just to stop the war and stop the violence. But in the meanwhile, what can we do to stop this fate from meeting other children? 
and Haras, one of our local um, partners, a brilliant um, ch children protection agency, the only one in Syria, um, told us about an early warning system that had been trialed with a great success in hospitals and, and suggested we try it in schools. And so that's what we've done. We launched the Save Serious Schools mm -hmm. campaign, and we are on a mission to introduce this early warning system, which gives children and their teachers seven to 10 minutes in some instances of warning before a potential airstrike. That's seven to 10 minutes of hopefully getting them to safety before the drop the bomb is dropped on them. So either for them to evacuate or to be able to get to some kind of safe space. Um, and, and so we are two thirds of the way and we would love, love, love your help to get us over the mark. So please go to saveseriousschools.org and, and, and give what you can. And you know, the idea Eileen isn't just to protect lives, but to heal minds. Um, this is not just about surviving, but about thriving. And so all of the children who are in all of the participating schools will have trauma recovery therapy um, so that they can be of sound mind as they sit and try and get an education despite despite the hellhole that they live on. So they live in. So, yeah, save serious schools dot org would love, love, love your support. Definitely count me in and I'm sure our listeners too. Um, so this week is about embracing achievements, being change makers in our own way. And I know many of us will feel that we are definitely far from your achievements but we should embrace our own. So what, what advice do you have for all the change makers out there? Any lessons to share in, in finding your voice and connecting with your power? So I feel like if there was one word that I would use to describe like how I, my work, what people have told me most about my work or, you know, whenever they see me or hear me speak or in the media, you know, they would say, oh, it's inspiring. And, and, and it used to make me cringe. It used to make me cringe so badly, Eileen. I, you know, it was a running joke with my husband. He'd be like, when, if I'd come back from speaking at an event, he was like, how was it? Did they say you were inspiring? And I'm like, oh no, they did. You know, and I really used to cringe, but, and I think it was partly because most people, when they say it, they say it with the energy of you are great and I'm not. It was not a relationship of equals of saying I'm remarkable and you're remarkable too. And I love that. I felt like it was putting me on some kind of pedestal, whereas I was just being me. I was just, I was just being what, what I was doing, right? I was just sort of being a doctor and going out there and upholding my values and doing my work. I didn't see it as being in any way extra, right? Um, but I also realized that it's because I got humility wrong. I used to think it was about sort of minimizing and like, oh, yeah, no, it's not, nah, 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 you know? Whereas now I know that true humility is like, it says, you know what, guys, I've got lemons. I've got delicious, amazing, juicy, citrusy, the lemoniest, lemoniest lemons in the world. And who's got ice and who's got water and who's got a glass? Let's make a delicious lemonade together. We are all remarkable, Eileen. We all have that seed of remarkability within us. It's just that some of us realize it and some of us don't. Some of us nurture our seeds to become oak trees and figs and roses or cacti and, and and others don't and so you know I think that for everybody here for everybody here change maker or not I want you to ask yourself two questions what am I remarkable at what am I remarkable at what what do I need to display or show what am I exceptional at and the second question is what seeds do I have inside of me that need nurturing that 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 novel that speaker that that change maker that you want to be whatever seeds that you know are in there but they need nurturing go ahead and nurture them because it's only when we nurture those seeds that we can find our we can really manifest that remarkability but we are all an absolute you know work of art in progress so embrace that inner remarkability um, and unleash yourself 
Thank you for sharing that. I can totally equate to that. And uh, even the, the, the thought of talking about how remarkable you are when I first ho heard of this program made me cringe, but it's such a wonderful program. Right. In for it, definitely. So we're going to take some, I'm going to share some uh, questions we've had from listeners. They're going to appear on screen. I'll read them out to you, Rilla. If we can line up the questions, that'd be great. So Ursula Mannion has said, my sister is a doctor as well and has done a couple of missions with some uh, I think it's NGOs, ONGs, but she is always gets frustrated with the amount of bureaucracy in institutions. How did you cope with that, Willa? Thank you for the question. Ursula. Thank you, Ursula, for the question. And um, so, I mean, the answer is I coped with it by not being part of it, essentially. Um, you know, that was why we work directly with these local um, aid and health workers um, and why I can do, we're determined to do things differently in a much more streamlined way. You know, people on the front lines don't have time to be filling in a zillion forms you know there's bureaucracy that you're talking about um and so i i dealt with it by by not dealing with it and by by being an advocate for the fact that that is the wrong way for us to be approaching humanitarian action in the first place fantastic and i'll take the next question anna sudi thank you for your question so your journey is incredible and you are amazing but it could be really hard was there a moment where you thought about giving up? Oh my God, so many times. Oh yeah, hell yeah, so many times. In fact, I remember there was one day I was stomping around and I literally was just effing and blinding. I was like, that's it, I've had enough, that's it. And I was I was so furious. And then I get this, I get this phone call saying, um, hi, we um, would like to give you an award for Woman of the Year Lifetime Achievement Award for all the wow. amazing that you've been doing and I was like Pfft. I was like oh you should have heard me a minute ago I was like I was ready to hand in my notice I'm like I'm out of here you know um of course it happens and I, I feel like it's not about not having those moments but it's about when you have those moments knowing what you need to do in order to get back on it um, now that could be you need to you need a bit of distance, you need a bit of time, and you need a bit of recovery, or it could be about reminding yourself, you know, why it is that you do what you do. Um, so yeah, hell yeah, so many moments, um, but here I am, still going. So glad you are, and thanks for your honesty. I'll take the next question, please. Louisa, thank you for your question. Dr. Ruller, you said the building of the Hope Hospital is the result of the incredible power of the collective action. Uh, what is your next ambition? So you've talked a bit about schools. Is that where your main focus is, Ruller, or are there, there other activities as well? Uh, Louisa, excellent questions. God, I'm, 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 I don't know if I call them ambitions because I always, you know, I'm, I'm very aspirational, but I don't know if I would call it ambition. But, you know, one of... Um, one of the things I've really come to realize is that the frontline health and aid workers, even now during this pandemic, right, like where we've now brought so much more attention and respect to the work of frontline health health workers. Um, but the problem is that the health and well-being of frontline health workers themselves is terribly, terribly neglected by them, as well as by policymakers and by institutions. You know, most of my colleagues on the front lines have not had a holiday in 10 years. They've had no psychological support. They've had no paid holiday time. They've literally just been working 10, 10 years around the, around the, you know, the, the, the clock 24 seven. Um, I've got so many deeply traumatized and burnt out colleagues, whether the ones who are fighting COVID or the ones who are, you know, in war zones. And so my deep and profound ambition that I have started to work on um, is to help frontline health and aid workers um, get the, the health and well-being that they need to really get the burnout and trauma recovery um, therapy that they need so that they can be not just surviving on the front lines, but thriving for their own sake as well for all of our sake. Because if our healthcare workers are, are burnt out and traumatized, then, um, well, then it's all going to shit, isn't it? Then we're all in trouble. So that's that's my next big ambition. Great yeah. question, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Louisa, for the question. And we have one more, I think we have time for one more question from the audience, which is from Juliana Lisboa. What was the most surprising positive thing that ever happened to you while out in the field? 
Oh, thank you, Juliana. I mean, honestly, there's been so many. I feel like, like I said before, you know, war, war really brings out the worst, but it really brings out the best as well. And, you know, in life, it is our choice what we decide to focus on, right? I could focus and just see the bombs falling, or I can see the bombs falling, but also see the people running to clear the rubble and get people out from under the rubble, right? I can just see about the, the, the sniper shooting, or I can see the people who are running to give food and aid and medicine and supplies to the people who have been affected by it. And so, you know, that positivity, that light, that beauty, honestly, is everywhere. But possibly the most incredible experience was um, back in 2013 on the same medical mission when I had the when I had the BBC team with me. And we were in one bit of northern Syria and um, very close to the front lines. And we were in a, we'd gone to a, a, an abandoned building because we were distributing food, emergency food and shel shelter kits um, to a recently displaced family. And out of this rubble, basically, comes this comes out this matriarch. And she reminded me of my grandma. Her face had like a thousand lines. Each could tell a thousand stories. And she told me about how a few days earlier in her village before it was attacked by the regime, she had stopped to talk to a regime soldier. And she said, my child, what are you doing here? We shouldn't be killing each other. Why don't you go home to your wife and children? And he told her that he hadn't been allowed to go and see his family for three years. And she told me they just sat there and cried together. Oh, gosh. I feel like that level of compassion, when you can have compassion even for someone who is a perpetrator or a potential perpetrator, that's the level that we need to get at because it's, it's that that's going to help us to break the cycle of violence and trauma and re-traumatization. Wow, yeah, absolutely. Super powerful. Um, so we, 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 we're, we're going to wrap up in a second. I have one final question before we finish today. today. Um, and, uh, you know, what gives you hope? Is, is it this compassion, Rilla? You, you know, you mentioned it brings out the worst and the best. Is that what gives you hope? That you can see good, even when the beautiful message, indeed. It, even in the darkest of times, you can see the positivity. Um, you know, I think it, what just inspires me every single day are, are these local humanitarians. You know, people like Malaki, who was the head nurse of the children's hospital that was bombed in Aleppo. She became the head nurse at our children's hospital in Hope, Hope, Hope Hospital. And, you know, Eileen, she was injured 10 times in the line of duty. She had her skull broken, she had her back broken, she had her limbs broken, she had she got severely burned. Like at any moment, most of us would have just packed our bags and said, fuck this, I'm out of here. You know, this is this is not for me. And she would literally recover, come back, recover, come back, recover, come back. Her story is remarkable, she is remarkable, and there are so many people like that every day. Ordinary people like you and I who are doing extraordinary things, who are doing just doing everything to uphold humanity for the rest of us. That that's the human spirit. We are divine creatures who've got the possibility to be elevated, to to literally embody love, compassion, generosity, all of these beautiful things. We have that possibility within us. And of course, we have the possibility to not. Um, and so for as much as I've seen devastation and and brutality, I really have I really have seen beauty, and so I I definitely remain hopeful about about our human species, regardless of of everything. Wow, a, a fitting ending. And on behalf of everyone watching this, uh, I want to thank you, Willa, for sharing, well, for joining us today, firstly, but sharing your incredibly powerful story and being so honest about your own personal journey. I'm sure everyone listening will value it so much and be, uh, you know, em empowered to help and use their voice too. Um, as I said at the beginning, you truly epitomize what it means to be remarkable. And I'm so happy that you're on that journey, that you can now accept that uh, and know that you're, you're, you're remarkable and see that in others too. 
Thank uh, so you. you could join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to see your faces. I'm just going to give you a wave. I'd love to hear from you. Please connect with me. I've literally, as part of finding my voice, got onto social media. Ooh. I've finally joined the 21st century. So, you know, in the link, I'm going to put my contact lenses or, or just go to Dr. Rilla Hallam. Um, dot com and connect with me. Um, I'd love to hear from all of you. But yeah, thank you, Eileen. Thank you, everyone at Google. Um, it's always a pleasure to be with you guys. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, for everyone listening, you should have the links, I hope, or just uh, use Google to search for Dr. Willa. Um, I'm sure she can be found. Um, we have more remarkable stories of inspiration and courage for you all to explore for the rest of the week. Please check out the agenda of the I Am Remarkable Week. Among 14 virtual talks and panels, you can still join a conversation with the legendary Jane Goodall on Wednesday, the 15th of September. And tomorrow we have a fireside chat with Luvi Ajayi Jones, a Nigerian American writer about how to overcome fears and imposter syndrome. So thank you all for being with us today.